All right. We are going to be finishing our study on Solomon this evening. Before I forget, the next character study notes are on the back table. They've also been emailed out to everybody. Uh, our study after we're done with Solomon will be on Christian women of the early church. We're going to look at Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, Lydia, Phoebe. Then we're going to look at Priscilla, Sapphira, uh, and Eunice and Lois of uh, Timothy's mother and, and grandmother as well. Uh, so that'll be for this study and then the next half of the study. Uh, Tabitha, Lydia, and Phoebe are on these notes. And then when we're done with these notes, we'll move on to Sapphira and, and Priscilla and so forth. Okay, so we finished last week looking at the fact that Solomon was led astray in his old age uh, after he allowed himself to uh, have multiple foreign wives who all had their own gods that they worshipped. And as a result, Solomon, it, it doesn't, the, the text doesn't say that he rejected Jehovah in, to the effect that he refused to acknowledge Jehovah or no longer believed that Jehovah was there, but that he served these false gods along with Jehovah. And we, we talked about, you know, Satan isn't going to just throw something obviously evil in front of us all the time to try to get us, to, to persuade us to, to do things that are wicked. It's going to be gradual. It'll be a little bit at a time, and a little bit at a time. And as we discussed last week, it's possible that these foreign wives of Solomon's started complaining that they had nowhere to go to worship their gods. They didn't worship, want to worship Jehovah. They wanted to have their own places to go to worship. And so Solomon may have grudgingly started out just by building those places for them to go to. And then maybe after a time, they wanted him to come with them or something along that line. So he started going with them. And then little by little, he began to become invested uh, but the source of all of this, going back to 1 Corinthians 11, is because of his love for those foreign wives. He allowed his emotions to overrule his better understanding. And this is probably one of the uh, biggest challenges that we as human beings have relative to God's word, is bringing our emotional thoughts, our, our, the wishes of our heart, into accordance with what God wants, even if that means denying ourselves what we think will, quote, make us happy or what will make us feel good. Instead, we have to follow what God's word has to say. And that, uh, like I said, it's not necessarily something that the Satan's going to throw at us. All of a sudden, this is obviously wicked, but it'll be little by little. And if he can get us to move an inch and then a foot before we know it, we're moving a yard and then a mile. Uh, and that may very well have how it happened with Solomon. But in all of his wisdom... Uh, despite all of that wisdom, he, he allowed that to happen. So even the wisest man, as far as we know, who ever lived, uh, that as far as God is concerned, especially as a leader of a nation, uh, this, uh, this can happen even to the wisest. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. 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 You know, and yeah. You know, we wonder what we do wrong. Right. What we do or what we say, and it's not up to us. All we got to do is plant. Yeah. Well, and it may, that may actually speak more to the heart of the Queen of Sheba as it does to the hearts of his wives. You know, that they were uninterested in Jehovah, whereas the Queen of Sheba had a heart seeking to learn. Now, that is good and, and fertile ground as far as the parable of the sower. Uh, 
Uh, that is ground where the, where the word can be planted and, and can grow in a heart that's seeking to know, seeking to learn, and is being sincere and honest. Uh, and, you know, of course, we're given very little information about Solomon's, specifically Solomon's wives, who led him astray. Uh, presumably, the Pharaoh's daughter that is mentioned earlier in 1 Kings, uh, presumably she may have been one of those. Uh, certainly, the Pharaoh or the uh, Egyptians had their own gods that they worshipped, and many of the Egyptians had one, were devoted to one specific god. Uh, they believed in all of them, but some were servants of this god and some were servants of that god. They had kind of different different tribes, if you will, different followings for the gods, uh, and the Greeks were the same way. The cities of Asia, uh, the difference, many of the different major cities of Asia had a temple dedicated specifically to this god or this god. Uh, the, the, Cor the Corinthian temple was dedicated to Venus, uh, and they were the keeper of the temple of Venus. And so they, in Corinth and these different cities in Asia, they, they prided themselves on being the ones who took care of that temple because this represented the Greek god of, in that case, of the goddess of Venus. Yeah, anything else on that? So as we talked about last week, uh, we, I mentioned the fact that it, I, I was asked, and, and many, many people have wondered why it is that we see example of like David and Solomon having so many wives, in this case, 700 wives and 300 concubines, as Solomon did. And going back to from Genesis through Deuteronomy, okay, or through Exodus even, uh, until the giving of the Mosaical Law, there's no indication specifically, and of course there's a lot we don't know about the patriarchal law. Uh, we know that there was a priesthood. Who was uh, a, a member of the priesthood uh, uh, under the patriarchal law? Melchizedek. Yeah, Melchizedek was one of the priests under that law. Uh, so I, I, I tend to think, given the absence of information and the abundance of the, uh, um, all of the fathers of the children of Israel, okay, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all of them, they all had many wives. Uh, and so I, I tend to think for population's purpose that God allowed that under the patriarchal law. Uh, again, I don't know that for sure. There's no scripture that specifically says that, but there's also no scripture that specifically condemns Abraham or Isaac or Jacob for having multiple wives. Uh, and as we noted, many of the, uh, in fact, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, the individuals who were the, the origin of the 12 twi tribes of Israel, the, the 12 sons of, uh, of Jacob, they came from multiple wives, Rachel and Leah. And so uh, I, I would tend to think that it, God allowed that under the patriarchal law. The question becomes under the law of Moses. Well, I went back and read through the giving of the law. I read through Deuteronomy. And there's nothing there that specifically condemns having multiple wives. There is the condemnation of adultery in the Ten Commandments. But adultery is having a sexual relationship with someone to whom you're not married when you are married or vice versa. If you're married to multiple women, would that count as adultery? And, and I, don't, I don't know how God viewed that under the Old Testament because we're not given commentary of the Mosaical law regarding multiple wives. But we know that many of them did. Many of the judges, Gideon, had many wives. David had many wives. Solomon had many wives. And you'll note that God, the condemnation to, to Solomon isn't his abundance of wives. What specifically is the condemnation regarding Solomon? being led away by his wife's false gods. So here's, I'm going to offer my thought on this. And if anybody has found or knows of a text other than what uh, that I have, have looked at, let me know. Because I've, I've been looking at this and trying to figure this out. But I, I, I tend to think God allowed it under the patriarchal law and under the mosaical law. But then under the law of Christ, we have references to, for instance, elders and deacons being the husband of one wife. First Corinthians chapter seven, each man have his own wife and each wife her own husband. Uh, there's several references to the idea of, of that monogamy in the, uh, in the uh, law of Christ. And by the time, I, I did a little bit of secular historical reading on this as well. 
And the suggestion by many of the scholars is that when Rome came into power and took over in Israel, they believed that polygamy was evil. They believed it was disgusting. And so they enforced no multiple wives when they took over as uh, overseers in Judea. And so by the time you have all of that happening, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and so forth, a lot of that has already been done away with in the Jewish tradition. Now, again, is that firm? Not necessarily. But all I can find in, t in the text about regarding multiple wives and condemnation of multiple wives has only thing, the only thing I can find is regarding the New Testament. Uh, again, under the Old Testament, adultery was, it, it, thou shalt not commit adultery. But having said that, if you're married to multiple women, does that count as adultery? Uh, and you have, now you do have the warning in Deuteronomy chapter 17, and starting in verse 14 and 15, God warns about what's going to come as they go into land of Canaan, and when they establish a king. Uh, verse 14, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you, that you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Verse 16, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Interestingly enough, Solomon does seem to actually do that. Uh, we see that in the recording of uh, 1 Kings chapter 10 with uh, the Queen of Sheba. After the record of the Queen of Sheba, we find him multiplying horses from Egypt. That's not specifically condemned there by God, but God does say in verse 16 that, that, that you're not to do that. Whether or not that counted as part of this, I don't know if it was the process by which they went about doing it or what. Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Now, verse 17, multiply wives for himself. Given the context, it's been suggested that he's not necessarily, there's not necessarily talking about wives of his own people, but wives of the foreign people, given the context of the horses from Egypt, uh, and having that foreign influence over them, that he shall not multiply foreign wives for himself. Whether or not that's the case, certainly Solomon did fail in that. He did multiply many wives for himself. I don't know of a single king, at least, who had more wives and concubines than Solomon did. Uh, but we see in verse 17, he shall not, uh, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself, which I don't know that Solomon was guilty of that. God said he would do that for him. Uh, so I don't know that Solomon was guilty of that specifically, since God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you wealthy. Uh, and, and that may be also part of that multiplying horses too. That may fall into that category, God, God multiplied to him that wealth. So that may not count as part of what's being described here. But I, I tend to think that verse 16 certainly does speak to the issue of Solomon in multiplying, certainly multiplying wives of having his heart turn away. Uh, and certainly the children of Israel were told not to intermarry among foreigners. Whether or not as the kings, uh, I, think, I think that was wrong for Solomon to do in the first place. Whether or not it was wrong for him to have multiple wives, I don't know. But to marry foreign wives, even as a course of politics, to establish alliances and so forth, if God says, I don't want you intermarrying with the uh, foreign peoples and the false gods and so forth, I think that's, that would have applied to Solomon just as much as the rest of the people. So even though the text ne doesn't necessarily actually say Solomon sinned in marrying foreign wives... I do think given that part of the law given to the children of Israel against marrying foreign wives, that was wrong. But in terms of multiple wives, again, I haven't found a specific verse that says that. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention also is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, this is after uh, David has sinned with Bathsheba. Uh, 
And Nathan is speaking the words of God to David regarding his sin. In verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Now, most interpretations of verse 8 isn't just that he was to take care of, as in feed them, make sure they had a place to stay, but that he actually received the wives as his wives of Saul. And God says in verse 8, I gave you those wives. Now, why would God give David multiple wives that once were Saul's if it was wrong for that to happen? Now, that's assuming, of course, that this doesn't mean that you're supposed to take care of them. But what God, the context of verse 8 is, God has blessed David. Now, if I have to just take care of Saul's wives and they're kind of just a burden on me, that responsibility having to take care of them. I don't know if you would call that a blessing or not, uh, but given the context, it would seem that his wife, Saul's wives became David's wives. Uh, and God says, I did this. I gave them to you. So again, if it were against the law to have multiple wives, I don't see God saying, I gave you these wives as your wives. I don't know. And nothing that I've read. The, right. Yeah, no. Yeah, I don't know why the concubines aspect of it. Uh, certainly, like in the instance we talk about Abraham and Sarah and the situation with Hera, Sarah's handmaiden, she would have been considered a concubine. She wasn't, there was no legal marriage there. Okay, now whether or not taking a woman for the purpose of establishing a lineage or children if there was some sort of a legal precedent that that counts as, even though there may not be an established royal mess marriage, okay, maybe this isn't, maybe these concubines weren't of a uh, royal identification. Maybe they were just, like I say, servants of a low class who were not allowed the privilege of being called a wife, and yet, by the Mosaic law, they were counted as a wife. I don't know. I don't know how concubines fit into that. If I, if it's standing here right now, I would say it would have been wrong based on our, our limited understanding of concubines, okay? And limited understanding of how the law of Moses dealt with concubines. I would say it was wrong for them to have concubines. Just from the perspective of if there was no legal precedent of them being looked at as wives, then it would have been adultery. I believe that would have been the case. Uh, and, and, of course, we see example in the Old Testament of, of, of concubines. Uh, but it seemed like kings were the only ones in that particular instance who had what were called concubines. Again, Sarah's handmaiden, for all intents and purposes, would have been a concubine. And yet, did that count as one? And I, I don't, again, that was under the patriarchal law now. Okay, that's, that's not mosaical law, but I, I don't know. I don't know how, how God views that. Again, given the fact that it's what we don't have recorded for us as opposed to what we do. Now, obviously, for us today, this is more of a speculative academic discussion because for us today, we have clear guidelines as to under the law of Christ as to polygamy versus mon monogamy and adultery and fornication and so forth. This is all in relation to how God dealt with those things in the patriarchal and mosaical law.
kind of a lower class. See, I've heard that suggestion that they were lower class wives and didn't have the official royal recognition of being a wife. Whether or not that's true, I don't know for sure. I haven't seen like the historical documentation on that, but I have, I have heard that as well. Okay. Not okay. Okay. So, that, so it may be that that was maybe a, a fluctuating type of status. Maybe the king's favored wives were considered wives. And when he fell out of favor, like uh, Queen Vashti, okay, uh, with the uh, Babylonian king in Esther, maybe then she was downgraded from wife. Certainly she was downgraded from queen and became a concubine. Uh, Okay. Well, like I said, and if concubine did not have any type of a, of a legal identification or recognition under the law as being a wife, then I think that would be adultery. Absolutely. If there was not that recognition that this is a, an established relationship by the law of Moses in that case, then that would be adultery. The king didn't have a right to just take whom he wanted. And example of that is who? Bathsheba. Yeah, David and Bathsheba. He wasn't just condemned for killing Uriah. He was condemned for taking another man's wife. The king didn't have the right to just take whoever he wanted, however he wanted. Uh, that's not how that worked. And David was held to account for that. And David recognized that he was guilty of that. Uh, but in terms of having legal wives, multiple legal wives, I can't find anything in the patriarchal or mosaical law that specifically says that was wrong. Concubines would be a question mark given their which status they would be. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, we've come a long way as a culture, and this isn't to say at all that the Bible is out of date, mm. but it was written into a certain context and a certain history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we probably don't understand it very well. But another thing is that God didn't attach himself to a person. Yeah. The, and, and you're absolutely right, Seth. The one thing I would add to that is that we have to be careful to acknowledge that individuals like Abraham and Sarah and Moses, these are individuals who the New Testament says they lived by faith. Okay. It's one thing for a faithful person to make a mistake and sin, as would seem to be the case with Abraham and Sarah lying to the kings. Uh, their dealings with Hagar weren't, weren't great, uh, events like with David and Bathsheba. It's another thing for people of faith to live in sin. That would no longer be living by faith. That would no longer be living faithfully serving, serving God. And so as it pertains to the New Testament's references to people like Abraham and people like David, and for that matter, people like Solomon, even though he did fall away in his old age, he did seem to come back uh, as of Ecclesiastes. I would not think that the Bible would refer to these individuals as people of faith if they were living in a state of sin, for, for instance, in having multiple wives. If that was something that God had condemned in the patriarchal law, and yet Joseph had multiple wives, Jacob had multiple, you know, all these, then why would they be called people of faith? If you're living in sin and you know better, you know God's word, you know what he wants from me. They knew because of the sacrifices they offered. They knew under the Mosaical law. 
So how could individuals like that be called people of faith if they're living in a state of sin contrary to God's word? Joe, I saw your hand. Her husband. So I'm not saying that every concubine was necessarily married, but right. There is some precedent to suggest that that there may be some precedent to suggest. And, and again, it may there may have been different states too. Some con, not all concubines may have been considered the same. Some concubines may have been considered wives. Some may not have been for whatever reason. I don't. I don't. I don't know. And I, what little I I found on the subject doesn't. A lot of it has to do with specific cultures. Uh, it, like it would change from culture to culture and from time period to time period based on who and what they considered a wife versus a concubine. Uh, ultimately, I'm glad I'm not having to judge that situation because God is. <laughs> what we have to go on is what we have written for us. Okay, And certainly, and as was already been mentioned, just because God doesn't condemn something in the text of the Old Testament, like David eating the showbread, what did Jesus say about that? Jesus said that was wrong. Okay, he had no right to eat of the showbread because the showbread was for who specifically? Whom specifically? The priests. Yeah, it wasn't for David to take. And so that was wrong of David, even though in the text, there's no reference to that having been wrong. Having said that, is, it, is there the possibility that under the, at least, this, at least under the mosaical, it seemed, and again, I have no context for the, the patriarchal law. We, we have very little in terms of that. But in terms of the mosaical law, is it possible God didn't want his people having multiple wives? It's possible. Uh, and, and certainly in context of the mosaical law, it's generally the leaders and certainly more wealthier individuals who had multiple wives. Gideon, David, Solomon, uh, most of all the, all the kings had multiple wives. Whether or not that was right, certainly it was wrong for them to marry foreign wives. And in that particular case, I think it was wrong for Solomon to have married these foreign wives. Just from that alone, much less the fact that he allowed them to lead his heart astray. Thoughts or comments on that? Oh, yeah. In fact, what did they have to do in that situation? They had to leave them. Yeah. I mean, talk about an emotional situation. Many of them had wives and children that were of a foreign people. And they had to draw a line and say, none of these foreign people are going to be allowed to remain in this place as part of your family. And you need to let them go back to their, pla their, their land. That's... <laughs> Imagine having such an emotional situation like that, and yet they did. They did. They purified themselves. They, uh, you know, had those individuals who were still subject to foreign gods go back, uh, who would not obey Jehovah. Another example of serving God is worth it. Yeah, another example that serving God is worth it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and I've mentioned this before regarding a friend of mine. His parents. They'd been married for 15, 12. They'd been married for longer than that. I guess it was about 15 or 20 years. But they had two boys, and he was not a Christian at the time that she married him, but he became a Christian later. Well, come to find out, he had been Catholic, and he'd had his first marriage annulled. So in his mind, he'd never been married before. Well, when he was taught the truth, he realized that he had been married before, and he had no right to be married. And the two of them sat down, they looked at the Scripture, and they asked the question, either we go to heaven separate or we go to hell together that was what it boiled down to they had to make that decision either we go to heaven separately or we go to hell together and they made the choice to separate because he did not have a right to be married and i i, I will always remember that as a source of great courage and faith in contrast certainly to their emotional state that they made a choice to serve god rather than their personal happiness well, in that case, she was guilty of fornication because she, she wasn't bound to this man. She did not. Well, she had no. Well, he, when he was talking about his past, he, 
you know, he said, I've never been married. Because in his mind, see, the Catholic Church erased it. An annulment is the erasure that it ever happened. So as far as he was concerned, he was never married. And so in the discussions of that, he just never even referred to it. He never even thought about it because it never happened. But, of course, keep in mind, he never became a Christian until 15 years later. So he didn't hear the truth about that or know the truth about that. But, yeah, talk about a, a difficult situation. But they, and they still love each other. They still talk on the phone. But they're states apart. They decided they couldn't live in the same, same city together. They had to move separate and apart. I have no answer to that. That is not something I have. <laughs> I have the ability to judge that. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, what's interesting about that, though, that's not the first time something like that has come up, where an individual has come and found out decades later or years later that my spouse was in a previous marriage for whatever reason. Either they lied about it or this individual just didn't think it counted for whatever reason. But I, I have personally had to deal with a couple in that situation before, years ago. That was a tough situation. In that case, they refused. They said, we're not listening to this. The husband called me all sorts of bad names, called me a racist and all kinds of stuff. And it was bad. It was, it was a tough situation to go through. All right. Anything else about this? I know there's not a lot of specific information in terms of, of how God views the multiple wives question. But what we do know was it was unlawful for Solomon to have married foreign wives. It was unlawful, well, certainly unlawful, for him to allow himself to follow into false false gods and worship of false gods. All right. Uh, let's see. There's, I think we only got one or two more here. Yeah. So in first Kings chapter 11, because of his being led astray by these false wives, God actually tells Solomon, here's what's going to happen. And instead of Solomon in this particular case, instead of Solomon actually looking inward and reflecting on the state and maybe even changing the situation, he got mad at the person who is supposed to be involved in part of the takeover of his kingdom, uh, similar to Saul with David. Uh, we, saw, we see in verse 9, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had been turned away from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, verse 11, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. And so in verse 14, the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. Uh, and we see starting in verse, mm, verse 20, uh, no, verse 21. Uh, so Hadad heard in Egypt, David rested with his fathers, that Joah, the commander of the army, was dead. Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart, let me go to my own country. Uh, Pharaoh said, let me go, or uh, he, he told Pharaoh, let me go anyway. And there was another uh, adversary, verse 23, that God raised up. And so through all of this is a man named Jeroboam, verse 26. Solomon's servant Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zareta, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the Milo and repaired the damages to the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the, the Shilonite, met him on the way, and he had clothed himself with a new garment. The two were alone in the field. And Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes, to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did his father David. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, because I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes. To his son I will give one tribe. 
that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you, and you shall reign over all your heart desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And it shall be that if you, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. Verse 40, Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt, to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. How did Solomon find out about this? I don't know. I mean, as far as we know, it's just a hija and Jeroboam in this field when this is being told to him. But presumably, God must have told Jeroboam, or Jeroboam simply went about, you know, broadcasting it. Maybe that's how it happened. Maybe Ahija at some point went and told uh, Solomon the same thing. But Solomon found out, and instead of Solomon deciding to change his ways or to, to fix the situation that he had caused, he sought to kill Jeroboam. And it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily ironic, but it's, it's sadly coincidental that it's the same type of thing that happened with Saul. Because what did Saul try to do? Kill David. Instead of Saul acknowledging his wrongs, humbly seeking repentance and so forth, he sought to kill David when he found out David was to receive the throne. And here Solomon is doing the same thing to Jeroboam. Thoughts? Nolan? He would warn him. Yeah. And, and of course, God, he does tell him that, you know, I don't, of course, whether, whether or not this, this conversation went on to include the fact that he was giving it specifically to Jeroboam, Solomon did find out about it, or God told him or whatnot, and he tried to kill Jeroboam as a result of it. Any thoughts through that? All right. The last thing I wanted to look at regarding, uh, regarding Solomon is in Nehemiah chapter 13 and in verse 23. Nehemiah chapter 13, and in verse 23. All right, so uh, this is, um, I got that right, Jeremiah 13, yeah, Nehemiah. Yeah, so this is as God is speaking through Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is describing all of this. He says, In those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one of their other people. So I contended with them and cursed them, struck some of them, and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him even to sin. Uh, and so Nehemiah, in discussing this, he uses Solomon as an example of what happens when you intermarry with these individuals who worship foreign gods, that it leads your heart astray. And of course, this is even broader than that. Just intermarrying among these pagans, as he calls them, uh, is part of the sin as well. All right, we will stop here. We will pick up with our questions very quickly next Wednesday night and begin our study on Tabitha, Lydia, and Phoebe. As I said, those notes are on the back table and they're in your emails as well. Thank you for buying.